You're very welcome along to the Keith Andrews Show. Last one of the season, unfortunately. Special guest in today, <laughs> fresh from his road trip down to Limerick last night, Mr. John Malloy. Hi, Keith. Hey, Paul. How you doing? How did last night go? Very nice. We were down in Brough Rugby Club in uh, County Limerick, John Hayes' home club. Yeah. Uh, John Hayes... Doesn't do a lot of media, does he? No, it? no, no. And I think literally because we, we went there and said, we're literally here. And his wife, obviously, is involved with the club, Fiona Steed, who played in three World Cups for Ireland. Um, so he said, all right, I'll come and do it. And then he had a great time. The first thing he said afterwards was, oh, I really enjoyed that. Good, actually, yeah, yeah, it was good, because it was all the people he knew in the yeah. room, and it was a lovely summer's evening, so we had the doors open and the sun going down, and we had a great nice. chat. And uh, like Hayes is one of those interesting types that, up until he was 18, had never touched a rugby ball. Seriously? Yeah, and then just on a whim, of, I mean, he was. Uh, he said he liked his GA, he liked his football, yeah. but he's a big man and he said he fouled a bit and maybe it wasn't quite physical enough yeah. for him, so he didn't love it. GA wasn't physical enough for yeah, him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and he went up on a whim to Brough uh, training one afternoon when he was 18, 19, and he said from his first training session, it was like this eureka moment of, wow, it. oh, this is, this is amazing. And from not touching a rugby ball before he was 18, 19 to... Uh, 217 Munster appearances, two in Cups, the first Irish man to ever get over 100 tests, he got 105 in the end, played for the, thir the Lions, their third test against South Africa, uh, just a phenomenal Staggering. career, it? uh, yeah it's a miracle really, yeah. uh, only made his debut for Ireland at 26, Did he? and got 100, the first man to get over 100 test matches, because literally his position tight head, we had no other tight head, yeah. like, I know Brendan Driscoll was our most important player for that period, but actually it was probably John Hayes in other no ways. Backups. We had no backups, so yeah. he'd have to do 80 minutes. So um, he's much loved, yeah, uh, yeah, John yeah. Hayes. What's the chance of getting him up around this desk? Absolutely zero. Really? 100%. <laughs> no, <Nope. laughs> I just... I'm going to ask. He lives at home now on the farm. Yeah. He has three kids. He's like full-time dad and farms. Both his parents are alive. They live across the road on the farm. Yeah. He's got kind of an, an idyllic so, yeah. uh, life. Makes their lunches every morning. He was telling us about it. And, Does he? Yeah, like... Roshin likes pasta, Billy likes a wrap, you know, he's petty for Lou, <laughs> different yogurts. He's uh, this huge killer. Yeah. Um, he's a domestic god now, so, uh, uh, so it was good, yeah. Good stuff. Right, we, um, you haven't seen this, have you? The off the ball team went to the Etihad Stadium a couple of weeks ago. I couldn't make it. You didn't want to go, apparently. Um, My toe was bust. Oh, your toe was not. bust, okay, yeah. from golf. I don't know what... Uh, Four iron. To make a long story short, it seems I have bloody arthritis in my big toe. Really? I don't know how. Wear and tear. You're right. I know. It's just That's not good. Wear and tear. So, um, so yeah, the lads went over. Um, Nathan, who I've commentated with on numerous occasions, I just had this perception that Nathan would be fairly decent. I've seen him play once. Football. I've seen You're him play once. You're probably not going to be surprised. So this is Nathan <laughs> bigging himself up beforehand at the Etihad. Remarkably, they're also going to let us go out onto that pitch and play a proper game of football. How many sprints do you reckon you can put into that? <laughs> Yeah, the performance analytics won't be pretty. I'm going to take the Yaya Toure role, slightly aging midfielder with a fondness for cake. Starts off right, it's a little bit awkward, I think, but then I'm going to set and get some up. Oh, it's just a practice until Phil gets back. <laughs> So we pick up the action now, okay. where the off the ball team are three two down in sudden death penalties. Um, Ender makes a three three. Okay. Phil saves. So we're going to go to it now. I think we're leaving the mics up, aren't we, Tommy? This is Ender. Ender. Is it? Ender plays football. Oh yeah. You can tell. He plays football. Like decent. He knows what decent. he's doing. So this is Phil and goal. Comfortable save. Phil got injured in the build up to the, it's a poor to the final. Poor penalty, but. And Phil, Phil had to fall on that penalty. Save. And now, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Who was that that ran up? That was Dennis, Dennis from marketing. He, f he thought that that was it, that they won. Okay, Dennis can't count. So he overreacted, and then he had to bring himself back down, <laughs> calm the nerves, penalty. Go on, Dennis, what have you got for us? Nice boots, nice boots. Very little yeah. is what he had for us. So then. That was a fairly safe effort, kick cool, wasn't, wasn't it? it? He wasn't really letting the leg go there. He's in the marketing department. I think we can let him away with that to a degree. Um, so Phil's back in. To be fair, this fella looked the real he looks deal. Like, he looks like a player already. Yeah. You can just tell straight Confident. away. Confidently. It's just the, the way his feet, the angle of his feet even, even you can tell. He's playing well, speaking of angles of feet, I want you to keep a close eye on Nathan Murphy so when he pops up next. Nice. He's just That's good down, penalty. Phil's not exactly filling that goal though, is he? Let's be honest. 
Oh, look at the arrogance of the strut look here. at the strut of this. <laughs> He's like a chubby Maldini. <laughs> Steps up, look at the boots, look at the swagger. Now keep an eye on his feet. This already looks wrong. What the hell was that? <laughs> he hit it with his heel. <laughs> Inconsolable. Dear Embarrassment oh dear. forever. Dear, oh dear. So, um... I blame Dennis. He's blaming Dennis, but... Look, he I lost the ability to count there, so... Uh, Criticises... This is going to be a whole players. Dennis uh, blooper reel. Week out. Yeah. Quite damning at times. Well, I do, I, I do play um, in a game with journalists uh, semi-regularly for a while. Is that the one on the Wednesday morning at, yeah. at the, the hockey place? Yeah. If any of you guys are ever upset with anything we say, <laughs> I would I've just suggest... That once. I would ju just suggest come down for five minutes and you'll suddenly go, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, now, okay, now I see. You'll never be upset again. You like, I couldn't care less what any of you oh. think. It's embarrassing. So, I played um, in that once. It's, it's at the hockey stadium, isn't it? Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. I think that's what busted my foot, actually. It's horrific. Joe, I've never played on a worse surface yeah. in my life. I went to the Phillips Sports Awards after that. So we played there for literally an hour and a half, non-stop without a break, right? On concrete. Yeah. Went to those awards. Might have had a few drinks at the awards. I woke up the next day. I swear, I couldn't move. Yeah. I, I li it literally is like it's the QPR days. It is yeah. just pure concrete and they just put a carpet over yeah. it. I actually think it's what's destroyed me playing there for about two years. Really? Yeah. Killer plays there a bit, doesn't he? Not very often. Oh, not. He does a little bit. I think it must be tough for you guys where, you know, if we put five passes together, people start going, ooh, tiki taka. <laughs> <laughs> Olé! Oh, right. Speaking yeah, about good. Tiki Taka, let's get on to the Champions League final. Mm. What a game this is going to be. Can't wait. I haven't looked forward to a game for... In, I just can't remember the last yeah. time I looked forward to a game so much. Well, I think we know what to expect from Liverpool. They're not going to change the way they play. Yeah. He, he's talking about tactics in the build-up a little bit, Klopp. Do you, do you remember the um, Borussia Dortmund game where they beat... Uh, Real Madrid 4-1 mm. 2013 I think it was yeah. Mario Goza went and man marked uh, Alonso to stop that first port of call with the passing so he's, t he he's referenced that in mm -hmm. the build up to this game but like this Real Madrid team is so different to that like Alonso was the, the main passer of a ball in that team whereas now you've got Kroos you've got Modric who, who do you stop and I genuinely believe if the front three of Liverpool are firing on all cylinders. Liverpool are going to win. I, re I, think, I, I think it's as simple as that because they're that good mm -hmm. and Real Madrid defensively, especially on their left-hand side where Marcelo plays like a left winger, will he sacrifice his game for the greater good? I'm not sure. And even with that, he's probably not even capable of containing Salah. So I think it's ripe for Liverpool, I really do. Kenny was in here with Kev last night doing a tactics board mm. and the football show I was listening on the way home from Bruff and if you were to boil down everything Kenny said, which was a lot, like I'm boiling down, I'm compressing here. <laughs> are uh, going to compress the 10 I'm going to compress, yeah. <laughs> he, he said um, he didn't want to make a call until he saw the Real Madrid team. He basically said we know what the Liverpool team mm. is going to be and I think we all do. He said if Real Madrid go with the diamond, he thinks Liverpool will win. I don't think they will. He said if Real Madrid go with five across midfield, <clears throat> he thinks Madrid will win. That's Kenny's summation. I think, I'm not so sure he'll do either. I have, a, I have an inkling that he'll try and get Benzema into the team. And with that, he might go with a compact four across midfield. Casemiro has to play mm -hmm. for a start, mm -hmm. but he didn't play the second leg against Bayern Munich, which was a, which was a big surprise. He may well go with this goal behind that front front two, but I just feel Benzema in the team makes them better going forward and Ronaldo plays better. Ronaldo plays the out-and-out -out striker on his own. Yeah. He looks a little bit isolated. Benzema's hold-up play in the last game was excellent. Yeah, it was, yeah. He and he's out. had a tough season, hasn't he? He's had a lot of criticism. So but you don't see Bale starting? No chance. No chance. I'm with Kenny in terms of what I would do. And I do think Zidane at times this season has showed real tactical nous when he's been under criticism, been able to tweak the system, drop big players, leave players out. Mm. But I would play a five across midfield. I really would. Yeah, that's what Kenny was saying. Kenny was saying he absolutely has to. Yeah. Against this Liverpool side, he has to. But even with that, their left-hand side 
is vulnerable. Really worries Well, me. if you notice against Munich in the semi-final when Bale came on, they yeah. went five across mm. and were still as open as you could be for the last ten minutes. Yeah. They didn't look compact at all. They just haven't got that defensive instinct in them to be able to constantly grind out results. Mm. You know, they're, a, they, they're a team that want to play with the ball. They're a team that aren't particularly interested without the ball. Certain players are better, mm. but Ramos and Marcelo down that left-hand side is a major, major issue. So for Salah, yeah. if I was Klopp, I would be saying, cheat. I don't want you tracking well, that's the Marcelo back. Because Kenny said, so imagine they go with two up top, and as Kenny said, pin the centre-halves. Yeah. What you're going to be saying then, if you're Lovren in particular, mm. you're going to be pulling the full back in beside yeah. you. Like, get tight to me, I've got Ronaldo yeah. here. So then you almost have a Salah versus Marcelo fight. Yeah. And Marcelo might look at this and say, I've been listening for weeks now about Salah. Actually, this is, a, this, is a, this is a one-on-one -on -one fight here. If he wants to cheat, Marcelo might say, well, I'm going to cheat too. Yeah. We might oh, literally have, will. We all have Marcelo here and Salah here both looking Free. at each other yeah. saying, well, yeah. we're both going to I agree, score. but then for me, from a Liverpool perspective, the onus is on the midfield. And I've mentioned this before about since Coutinho's left, the balance of the Liverpool team is better because yeah. of what he can put behind that front three. Yeah. So if Salah does go roaming or does stay a little bit advanced, one of Henderson, Milner, Van Aldem, whoever it is, just shuffles across and at times Alexander-Arnold takes him. Because mm -hmm. whoever plays left wing or whatever system they play for Real Madrid, Marcelo will provide the width, they'll roam inside. So then that's, that gets taken care of by one of the Liverpool midfielders. It's a lot, it's a lot of shuffling over 90 minutes. It is, but Salah is that good. You don't want him 30 yards from your goal for a lot of the game. You want him in that half cheap position that when Liverpool win the ball back, they can play him early and he can counter-attack from in and around the halfway line. Because yeah. it's so much easier than doing that from the edge of your own box. Yeah. And he can get out. Can you imagine him running at pace, at Ram Ramos, backtracking all the way? Mm. There's only one winner. Mm. And if Ramos wins in terms of getting the better of him, he'll, pro he'll probably take him down. He could get red carded. You know what he's like. Yeah. That is a major issue for Zidane. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know what he's going to do about it because Marcelo can't change. So the onus for them will probably be on Casemiro getting across. Yeah, how do we work around Marcelo will yeah. be there, as opposed to change Marcelo. Uh, it was interesting, there's loads of good pieces about this Liverpool team. I really like this Liverpool team. Mm. Didn't grow up a Liverpool fan, but you go through that whole team and there's characters I like right the way through. So Jordan Henderson did a really interesting interview mm. there with Oliver Holt on Sunday. Like, it's mad, you never know what's going on with the player. So for four years, like four years, you think about that, his dad was fighting throat cancer. And his dad seems to be a very proud man, you know, northeast of England, yeah. kind of tough man. And whenever he was going in for extended periods of treatment, would say to Henderson, you're, I don't want to see you. So you're not to visit me, you're not to come to the house. Mm. I'll talk to you on the phone or by text. And um, it's a dreadful effect on, on Henderson, as you can imagine. So he felt the only way he could kind of help his dad was to play well. And, and that was kind of what he was doing for four, four years. long years. Yeah. Like the great thing is his dad's come through it yeah, now. He's and fine. He's, he's gone the game, isn't he? Gonna be in Kiev, yeah. which is an amazing yeah. thing. But like it's such a cliche and we say it on the show all the time, but you never watch a game as a you know, as a fan or as a journalist, you never watch a game and think maybe they're having a tough time in their life. It's and it is a difficult part of it. The other the another aspect of it is that players play through a lot of injuries. Yeah. that we don't know. Yeah. So as soon as you're out of that inner sanctum, you don't know what goes on, you don't know what injuries players are carrying, so just to get through games. Mm -hmm. And then those solid citizens of football teams and football clubs, you, we, you hear that term all the time, and it, it kind of gets tossed away as, oh yeah, whatever. Yeah. But they're the ones that have an ability to grind through games and for the, for the goodness of the team, regardless of their performance. So you read the paper the next morning, oh, Jordan Henderson, six, yeah, five, whatever, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But he plays through the pain, he plays through the personal torment. And certain other players, unless they are in prime condition, mm -hmm. can't play, sorry. Well, we saw Steve Jarrett about, about Daniel Sturridge. Sturridge's been a prime example. Prime no, example it's true, so it's, it's a heroic six out of 10. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess the lovely thing is all the team know that like that guy's leg is hanging off him. Yeah. And all the manager wants him to do is go out there and sit in the center circle mm -hmm. and fill a hole. And so the fans are looking on going, this guy's doing nothing. Exactly. But you all know. He's gone through pain, yeah. torment. It's really interesting. Like Mourinho's been critical of it this season, hasn't he? He's mm -hmm. come out a few times of they're not willing to play. Even Lukaku in the cup final Yeah, says he's not ready to play. No, that was total World Cup. Oh, well, yeah, on the horizon. The other interesting um, story I saw just from this 
a Liverpool team. Mo Salah at the weekend. Jonathan mm. Northcroft went to um, his hometown in Egypt. Loads of interesting bits in it. As you can imagine, Mo Salah is very popular. Um, Egypt has its issues. In their most <laughs> recent election, there's a population of 100 million. Mo Salah got a million votes <laughs> in their latest election. People just went and spoiled their vote, Mo Salah, and take the box beside him. Can't quite make up my mind, so I'm going to go with Salah. A million people did this. Um, and seems to be incredibly generous. Like, he's, he's set up a school in the area which is against religious extremism and it's just mm. about educating the kids and there's a number of medical things there. He, sp he spent half a million of his own money on a medical centre. Now, I know he's wealthy, but half a million is half it's a million. substantial. It's substantial. Yeah. Like, you could very easy to think to yourself, well, hang on to half a million. Yeah. And he's given money out all the time. Now, some of his generosity apparently has been exaggerated. Right. There are some, like, you know, Mo Salah myths. Yeah, but yeah. he does seem to be very generous. And the other thing that stood out was, um, like, it's not a surprise, but ferocious work ethic. So up until the age of when he was 14 and properly joined a club in Cairo, he lived five hours away from Cairo. So from like 11, 12, 13, he would go on his own. I think it was like bus, then something train, train then another home. bus. Yeah. And it was four to five hours there, train, and then four to five hours back at 13, Staggering, go it? to bed at midnight or one and get up at seven for school the next day. You don't get to where you are easy. That's, that's proper dedication, isn't yeah. it? proper dedication. I was chatting about this earlier actually to the lads in the office and like to put it into context, can you imagine, like he, he's got a million votes in that vote, right? Can you imagine if we had a player that was playing in the Premier League for Liverpool, mm. scoring that amount of goals, nailing it all across, can you imagine <laughs> it's all we talk about. for it yeah. that would be in this country yeah. around the, if it was Robbie Brady who bounced on from that and next of all oh he was going along nicely and then that season he just went yeah. one of the best players in Europe the country would literally be off the charts <laughs> wouldn't it though oh yeah it's, so it's, you can understand it like this is an Egyptian it's hardly a huge tradition of no f creating football and greats over there it would be it would be ridiculous I'd say I mean apparently he uh, they were saying in the piece as well literally Every advertisement is Mo Salah. Mm. Mo Salah with soft drink. Mo Salah with, you know, tire cleaner for your car. <laughs> Mo Salah with everything. Well, he had the thing with the airline a few weeks ago, didn't he? The airline, he? yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's across everything. Mm. I guess we had Roy Keane was probably the closest. Yeah. We had to, like, Champions Leagues. And, yeah. you know, and we were obsessed with him. And, like, ten years later, we we're sort still of still are. still obsessed with everything he yeah. says. Like, I remember when Michael Essien was playing, the country there was obsessed with him. Like, mm. every night in the radio, they would just talk about Michael Essien's form for Chelsea. Mm. You know, because he was just, like, the biggest thing they had. Um, yeah, I guess... Don't have a big role to play though. Big, big yeah, role. Yeah. He has to, he can't keep defending. I keep going on about it. Keep going on about it. And the other one for Real Madrid, Ronaldo, probably be fit. Got a great start here for you. Real scored 323 goals mm -hmm. in 741 appearances. Mm -hmm. and I think we'd all agree Real was a... Genius. Real Madrid legend. Yeah. Champions League, year in, year out, had that knack of scoring without any pace. He was just such a clever player. Ronaldo, 450 goals in 437 games. Phenomenal. Will we ever see that again? <sighs> like, records always tend to get broken. Yeah. But that is staggering. Yeah. Like he, he's been there nine, I think this is his ninth season at Real Madrid. He'll never catch Raul's because he's, he was there for, in terms of the appearances, yeah. because he was there. I think he played 13, 14 seasons. But, Joe, they are ridiculous. Mm. Let's not forget, the vast majority of that was playing from the wing. Yeah. Like, I just wonder, will we? has it happened because maybe players are better protected? But, like, it's not, like, it's literally Ronaldo and Messi, and no one else is even close. No. So, I like just. Like, Salah's at this season that are on those yeah. levels. Do it for 10 years. Exactly. Yeah. Or come back to me in two or three years if you do it next year. Everyone's going to be looking next year. I think next year, if Salah gets 25 to 30, it's still a. Huge, massive oh, year. Amazing. Um, Ronaldo said during the week he's got a biological age of 23, he feels. He can play till 41. 40. Now, he's not playing like a 23-year-old. No, he's not at all. I, I, I think they've started to go mm. legs-wise. Look, he, in terms of his condition, phenomenal. Yeah. Nothing else he can do Did better. you see him on the beach this week? Yeah. He's like a superhero. He was unbelievable. Yeah. Like, phenomenal. They're all on holiday, actually. Did you notice that? Yeah, they get a little break. Firmino was off on a, on a yacht. It's, it's an interesting one, though, because... I would not let them out you, of my sight. Yeah, but you, you become mentally tired. A little break in two, three days. And let's not forget, it, like, it was even the same with the playoffs, because we're going to talk about that yeah. in a little bit. They have that 10-day, two-week break in between the last game 
and then final. Mm. So what do you do to get these players in prime condition? If you have them in all the time, they're going to become stale. You need to keep it as fresh as possible. So the manager will be speaking to the, the sports scientists, the medical side of things. And players of that calibre, it's something at the end of it. It's not like 10 years ago, give the lads three days off, they're going to Ibiza or Marbella for a few days. It's like they go and have that downtime, they'll yeah. still be going to the team, still be doing things in the right way. Yeah. And they just come back mentally fresh, okay. ready to go. Makes sense. The other uh, striking thing, uh, there was a picture, and it, it struck me, particularly at the, um, the World Cup four years ago when I was there, um, is how skinny everybody is. <laughs> skinny. There is like like they are gaunt, you know. Like it's when you see them in the flesh or next to normal human beings. Yeah, yeah you don't. Really I remember see, I remember seeing um, Diego Costa, and Diego Costa you think is a beast. Yeah. I remember he walked into the uh, mix zone, looking at his legs, mm. like stick thin. All of them, have, uh, all of them. You, I guess, stick thin legs and these tiny little calf muscles. Mm. And I guess when you're all next to each other in the pitch. There's a different kind of normal, but you yeah. see them next to real people. Normal people, yeah. Just uh, sports stars, it's really struck me the last four, five, six years, it's just about being lean. Mm. They're just skinny. And Ronaldo in those beach pictures, he was standing there with a group of mates. Yeah. And like, he's ripped, but he's also, they're all bigger than him. Yeah. They're just normal lads. Mm. Like, they just, and they're just a bit wider than him. Mm. And it's, in, it's like the, you're all just skinny fuckers, <laughs> is the thing, uh, is what strikes me. It's incredible. Like you're, you're, you're a rake thin. And I don't think people appreciate until, I guess, you get to, to meet sports mm. person after in sports person him. coming in. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I saw an interview with Harry Kane, and the first thing the interviewer yeah, said was, him, this guy's actually gaunt. Yeah. Um, yeah. But next you to think about 22 it, other the, gaunt people, he When you fine. first went over to England, the, the body fat threshold used to be about... 12% I think when I first went over. Yeah. The players had come back in pre-season like 16, 18%. So pre-season was getting that down. I'm By now you want... 16 like, I'd say, am I? What, yeah. would you, what would you say? Less I'd say. Less, okay. But yeah, a lot less. 14? Yeah. Right. And what are the lads now? Oh, like 4 or 5%. Like, I don't there's have that to lose. There's a level that you need to stay above. It, it gets a little bit <clears throat> unhealthy as you get, get down below yeah. that your immune system, all the rest of it. I'm, look, I'm by no means an expert, but yeah. as the years went on, that 12% soon became 10% to 8%, and that, that was like, and it was it was competitive then, you know, and What's your sports percentage? scientists had to change from getting body fat down to, look lads, you're getting a bit too skinny and pasty yeah, yeah, and all yeah. the rest of it here, you need to bump this up a little bit. Kev used to joke about the Irish 10%, he said that we have bad genes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess with like such a small gene pool and like we're just, you know, potatoes. Yeah. That uh, Irish players would struggle to get much below 10%. Yeah, be like, my best was about eight and a half, but that was an effort. Was it? Yeah. And, and you're, like, you're especially good by Irish standards. But Kev said the joke was, ah, he's an Irish 10%. Yeah. There's no, like we're not going to get Robbie Keane below 10%. <laughs> the genes won't allow it. It's true though. It's true. Right, what, go on, call it for the weekend then. Or are you going to do a Kenyan and wait on the team selection? Um, Real Madrid. Are you going to go Real Madrid? Yeah, I think they'll get it done. Just because of the, the nasty experience? I just, they're guaranteed to play a 7 out of 10 game. Mm. I still don't trust Lovren. I still, he's made continual mistakes. Mm. I think it'll be 2 or 3, you know, 3-2, three, 2-1 two, two, yeah. kind of territory. But I, I don't think Madrid are as bad defensively as we're all saying. Mm. Like, I think Marcelo will have his head screwed on a bit more than people are implying. Like, how could you not? It's been talked about for two weeks. He never um, has, though. I know. Never um, has. I really hope Liverpool do it. I love this team, and I wouldn't be surprised. I think it's on a knife edge, mm. and it's almost because I see it on a knife edge. That you're going with Real Madrid. Just going with the experience. Yeah. yeah. Should we have a tenner on a tenner on going? Liverpool? Sure. Tenner. Buy me a coffee. Okay, Unai Emery took over Arsenal. It looked like Arteta was getting it. I thought yeah. they were going through the, the whole process of, oh, we're interviewing him, we're doing it in the right way. Bit of a tokenism one, by all accounts, to Patrick Fieri, who I've heard from very, very close quarters that that was absolutely accurate, that it, he felt the conversation, the phone call was, look, we feel like we have to go through this, but never made him feel like it was even... Possibility. Yeah. That's outrageous. For someone of that importance to the club, historically, yeah. the pedigree that he has, the way he's going about his coaching career, management yeah, career, yeah, in yeah. the right way, for that... That's poor, isn't it, really? Well, it also might be a case study in how the Rooney rule could end up being mm. completely abused yeah. and Spot ignored off. as well. I mean, did they go to him because they wanted to say that they had interviewed a non-white candidate? Yeah, maybe, yeah. And maybe, if they did, yeah, that's they did. disgraceful. Ian, Ian Wright brought that up. Yeah. 
he said, well, have they gone to him because he's a legend or have they gone to him because he's black? Yeah. And wondered. And he said, I can't, like, I don't know, but I hope... You're gonna, never going to be able to prove it. No, I, but that they wouldn't actually give Patrick Vieira a decent interview. How, how he wasn't flown over or they flew over to see him, mm -hmm. I don't know, because he is a credible candidate, candidate right. without a shadow of a doubt. It seems Emery won this thing in the interview. He, I have to say, I've seen bits and bobs of him, mainly Sevilla, not so much at Valencia when he, when he guided them to top four, top three, three out of four seasons. Mm -hmm. It was the Europa League, three years on the bounce, that kind of shot him to everyone's promise, and, and in particular PSG. Yeah. Very tactically astute. I think he's got a bit of fire in his belly. And if yesterday's day one, making an impression is anything to go by, I think he'll be a success at Arsenal. Because he has got something about him. Mm. that He's got a level of authority and level of confidence that I like, that doesn't go too far where you're cocky and arrogant. I thought he nailed it yesterday. Right. And the way he spoke, the way he came across, little snippets that he was saying. And if I was a player in Arsenal's dressing who was serious about achieving things and not just wanting a nice cushy life, which they've had for a long time, mm. I would be very excited about his appointment. Very interesting. Um, he started managing at 32, so he's got 600 games under his belt. Already. Which is serious, yeah. And um, I mean, that att counter-attacking football he played with Sevilla, that involves having a team well organised mm -hmm. and being able to be comfortable defending for periods. Yeah. Which is kind of the opposite of what you think Arsenal Exactly. Do. A couple of calls. When you don't have possession of the ball, I want the squad very, very intensive for the pressing. Hmm. So as soon as I read that, I thought... Mesut Ozil. Not uh, Arsenal. I brought it down. <laughs> Ozil. Did you? Yeah, did you. Where is he fitting into that? Because yeah. he's just signed a new deal on Cheddar. So where is he fitting into Surely this? it's possible to sit down with him one-on-one -on -one and say, things are going to have to change mm. and you're going to have to do this for me there. Because, like, Ozil looks fit. It's it's just an attitude thing, no? He's lacklustre, isn't he? His demeanour and yeah. he just goes through the motions. But, I, I don't know. Like, if... if Because the whole contract situation with him and Sanchez, they didn't want to lose both, both of them on yeah. free transfers. It, for that style that he wants to play, yeah. Sanchez would have been perfect. Yeah, yeah. As yeah. maybe the one behind one of the strikers, set the tone, set the trap, go, and then he's got the pace to go. I just don't think Ozil has it in his locker. It's, it's, it, but you know, I remember being at um, Ireland, Germany in Cologne a couple mm. of years ago, and Ozil was there that night, and he was just phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, really class, and you think there must be a way to work around this guy. But he's class, Joe, when, when you have 80%, 70% possession that, yeah. of a game, and he is, I, I totally agree, and he does things in the final third of a pitch that most of us could, could only dream of. Him and Nathan Murphy, really. Are Him and just... Nathan have arrived there. Like. But it's when your team are under pressure, yeah, the big yeah, games, yeah. and they come up against their equals or slightly superiors. Where is he? Yeah, fair That's point. not good enough for a player that you're paying that much money and that fee. And that so interesting so to see if Emery can turn that around. Yeah, and if he does... Because he seems cute enough. He was given... Yeah. He was given remember the, did you hear the USB story? No. So apparently, I mean, they say all managers obsessed with football. Mm. He seems to be genuinely obsessed to the point where he'll edit the clips and stuff. Like he's a bit almost too, too hands-on almost. But um, he'd give all the players individual USB sticks right. with their stuff on it as well as doing his general hour yeah. a day. And he thought one player wasn't watching. improving or watching. So he gave him an empty USB stick and went to him the next week and said, you look at your stuff, what do you think of it? And the guy said, yeah, no, great stuff, boss. Yeah, yeah, got it. And then he got it. <laughs> and then he got it and he was yeah, gone. he got it. So... Um, you know, he's, he's, yeah, that yeah. was kind of in yeah, interesting. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Okay, um, we need to move on. Yeah, work away. Playoff final, Aston Villa against Fulham over there on Saturday. The most lucrative game yeah. in world football. 170 you... million right. if you get up. And if you stay up for a season, it's estimated minimum 280. All right. Sponsorships, endorsements, all the rest of it staying up. And then obviously the parachute payments, worst case scenario for the following three years. So stay up, which all three teams did last year, Brighton, Huddersfield and Newcastle, yeah. 280 million. I saw if Liverpool win the Champions League, for everything they've done in the Champions League, they'll still have made 80 million less than Newcastle get for finishing 10th. It's madness, isn't it? Yeah, remember the Champions League used to be yeah, like everything? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I saw you were very angry watching the Aston Villa semi-final second leg. Yeah, a few people have said that. I didn't think... I thought you were spot on, though. Yeah. angry, was I? Yeah, I had a few texts about that, and I was thinking, did I... And I watched it back, and I was, I was quite happy with what I said. No, you were... It was brilliant. So Villa over two legs against Middlesbrough, tactically superb. So they know what I'm talking about, Marcelo, sacrificing his game for the greater good. 
Well, Villa did that. Big time did that against. So Traore, who plays for Middlesbrough, speed, lightning, pace, powered a lot. He was their game plan. Mm -hmm. And that didn't work out because Alan Hutton and two, three players around them slowed him down, nullified him. Middlesbrough didn't have anything else. But Villa were tactically brilliant. Okay. The way they done that, they nicked the goal away from home, sat in, comfortable second leg. For them to be Fulham in the final on Saturday, they're going to have to play probably their best game of the season Yeah. if Fulham turn up to beat them because Fulham are, it's a clash of experienced campaigners versus inexperienced. Who are the experienced? Villa. Okay. Boyette Miles, Alan Hutton Ol types. Alan Hutton, yeah. John, John Terry. Terry. John, uh, Sessegnon, you heard of Sessegnon, yeah. obviously, but turned, seven, turned 18 last Friday. I haven't seen him, I've heard a lot about him. He was two days old when John Terry was on the bench for an FA Cup final. So, to put it into context yeah. about the experience versus the inexperience, he is he's a very, very exciting talent. I think mm. He's got 15 goals this season, scored in the second leg against Derby County. Mm. And it's a clash of styles as well, Fulham had the most possession in the whole league, most passes, even more so than, than Wolves. And then Villa, for me, to, put, to give you an idea of what Villa have been like throughout the season, there hasn't been one talisman, there's been a few. So Grealish, since yeah. Christmas, has been top notch. Snodgrass, creativity, delivery, goals, assists, but they've all taken it in turns. Albert the Dahmer from the left hand side, he's got a lot of goals. He's he's a little bit awkward at the moment. Mm. Connor Horan's had a really good season. Mm. Eleven championship goals. And he's a very solid citizen and amongst all that. I'm a little bit torn because I hear great things about Fulham mm. and I like Craven Cottage and I wouldn't mind them back in the Premier League yeah. at all. And yet, even though Jack Grealish has kind of made his decision and everything, I do have a residual interest in him. I want to see how good he can become because there was a period when he first burst in the scene where he looked amazing, that FA Cup semi final yeah. and a few games. And I keep hearing he's been brilliant for uh, Villa since Christmas, that he's playing in the number 10 role now as opposed to out in the wing. And even Steve, Steve Bruce was making the point that, like, OK, this guy went a bit off the rails, but it was a bad time to be at this club. He had five different managers. Yeah. It wasn't a good dressing room. And now he's got his head screwed back on. And, I, you know, I'm kind of curious to see how he does in the Premier League. So I'm only 22. I'm a, yeah, I'm a little bit torn. Now, I know lots of people watching will say, who cares what Jack Grealish does? Mm. But personally, I'm a little oh, but bit look, interested. Take, take his decision in terms of not wanting to declare for yeah. us having, despite having played all the way through. Take that out of the equation and look at him as a, as a footballer. You're right. The reason he hasn't progressed to now is because of his off-pitch, day-to-day life. Mm. And a big part of that was the dressing room at Aston Villa. So, it, by all accounts, and it sounds like it was a bit of a throwback, you know, the culture within the dressing room was toxic. Really was toxic. Yeah. And I think that's where Steve Bruce deserves a lot of credit for eventually managing to get those type of individuals out of the dressing room, mm. getting the right ones in, John Terry, Glenn Whelan, Yedinak, players that have played at a top level for a long, long time. Jack Grealish is looking at them and going, oh, this is how you are a <laughs> professional footballer. Yeah. This is how you play top Premier League football. This is how you act. This is how you be yeah. and make the most of yourself. Isn't it, isn't it interesting the Stoke dressing room has turned quite toxic when a Glenn Whelan type uh, leaves? John and, Walters. Yeah. I'm not saying it's all down to Glen Whelan, but like it's just kind of an interesting. They are one of my pet hates, though, Joe. That that football club has been one of my pet hates over the last two years when I've been commentating on Premier League games. So anytime I get Stoke over the last couple of years, I'm literally going, "Oh no, oh no," because of that very reason. The recruitment has been disgusting. They tried to get rid of the likes of Glen Whelan, John Walters, Bardsley. Every time try and put players in to their position, wouldn't work out. Who do they call upon? Come on, lads, back in. We haven't won in six. Lads get them back on the straight and narrow. Yeah. Oh, let's take them, them back out again. Oh, no. oh. Every summer, Glenn Whelan was like, here comes another yeah, one. Exactly. Uh, who's going up between Villa and Fulham then? If Villa play to their cap, my only worry about them is the lack of experience playing. Only two of the starting 11, anticipated starting 11, have played at Wembley. Whether they can play in that type of magnitude to their capabilities, Villa need to ruin the game. <laughs> Villa need to make it. <laughs> A spectacle that we're not going to enjoy watching. Okay. For them to have it, like take your time, slow the tempo, slow the momentum down. They're the oldest starting eleven in the in the championship, so. But they've had ten days to prepare for this. They've had a little bit of breather, so they can produce it. Those players behind Lewis Graben plays up front. Grealish, Snodgrass have to have massive games, mm. but you can catch Fulham on the counter attack right. and defensively. 
they're vulnerable and they're also vulnerable from set pieces and crosses. You've swung which me, Villa are very good at. You've swung me back to Fulham, I have to say, basically. Have I? Yeah. I think they're the favourites. Yeah. I haven't looked at odds, but I think they are the favourites if they can perform. I just don't like the thought of Aston Villa's best chance is to ruin the game. I, it is, in my opinion, well, yeah. That'll be their best chance quite a bit next season as well if they get back to the Premier <laughs> yeah. League. So I'll but it would that. be nice to see a club like Villa back in the Premier League. Yeah, it's a great stadium. When we were growing up, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a Premier League club, isn't it? Mm. Premier League club. Okay, we've got, um, where are we going, Tom? We're going on, we're going to have a look at a few. Um, it's our last episode of the season. We thought we'd take a look Aww. back at some of the best interesting piece we've done Pete? on the show. It's the last you're one. You're in the for the World last Cup? one. No, you're not doing this during the World Cup. Well, I'm going to be knocking in and around the World Cup show. Okay. Uh, we're going to kick off, kick off with a special guest, AP McCoy. Uh, it was the week before Cheltenham. AP popped into the studio for a chat about his career. A brilliant piece, which you can watch back over at youtube.com forward slash off the ball. This story pretty much sums him up. I had this goal, my, this was my target. I didn't want to be a sports person that someone said he's not as good as he once was. And I, I'm, I was that kind of person that I never cared about. He was, I was actually making sure that I wasn't saying to myself you're not as good as you once were mm. you know I didn't want that to happen I, I used you know I used to use the excuse that I didn't want people to think he's not as good as he was but I didn't want myself to ever think that I wasn't as good I didn't want to get to a point halfway through the season and think you're gone you know you haven't got it anymore mm. so it was important for you to come out on a high so it was important to go out so I, I you know I told him and he said look you've got to think about these things and and, and I, I, at the beginning of that year, I rode my fastest 50th winner ever in a season. I rode my fastest 100th winner in a season. I came home that night and I said to my wife, and she heard it in the Sky Sports newsroom that I'd ridden my 100th winner, fastest 100th winner. And she goes, oh, it's amazing. You know I said, you know what, I said, I said, you know what, Shalane? I said, I actually think I'm getting better. I said, Did you, you say that to her? Yeah. I said, I think this is the first time in my life that I actually think I know, I'm, I actually think I've got it. I've got, I know what I'm doing. And she looked at me and think, you psycho. <laughs> and and I and, and and she actually genuinely looked at me thinking you're a psycho. And and I, I but I I genuinely because statistically I felt like I had. Yeah. You know, I'd spent twenty years. But you thought after nineteen years I've got I've been champion jockey. This now I've got it right. Yeah, now I've got it right. And then Some man. Amazing. Some man. Um Anytime he's been interviewed, anytime he's speaking, I'd make a point of listening. listening. Yeah, he's, he kind of has that, doesn't he? Just all substance yeah. and intelligence and a touch of madness mm. that he's able to analyse. He's yeah. phenomenally interesting. Did you see the documentary about his last season? Yeah. He's just powerful. Like, he definitely has his demons, uh, which makes him all the more compelling well, I, in I, some ways. He, I've kind of known him for a few years, and um, we, I was around his house for a dinner party when they were recording that. Um, Mick Fitz was there and a couple of trainers and and uh, we stayed at his house and the next morning we were having breakfast. That was the first time we'd had breakfast in two weeks. Right. And it was his first day off and God knows how long and it was like, this was a treat. But then after that he wasn't going to eat again. Uh, so intense, to have, do, to have done that for 20 years. Uh, it's unbelievable. And like, you know, Ruby is there for the big days and is a phenomenon. And with this guy driving eight hours to ride one yeah. potential winner in Newcastle. He's hungry for winners. Um, I must watch that back. I didn't see that. I'm sorry brilliant. to say, I will. No, no, he's he's, I, I'm, I'm going to check. I played that out. golf from the day. We played in a golf day the other day. I didn't actually play with him, but I was on the range room before, and, and he's changed his swing. Yeah. He's as intense about golf as he is. I think he's well, playing he, the prom yesterday. At he was, yeah. He was playing Brian Driscoll and uh, Paul Carrington and Keith Wood. Oh, was he? Yeah. Uh, I would say he just needs an outlet. He, if if he doesn't have something to whatever this whatever you know yeah. went wrong with him. Yeah. The wires got mashed that he needs to actually overachieve and everything in life. If well, he's done a Q&A he afterwards with um, golf, Ed Chamberlain and, and Kieran Fallon. Right. And uh, Ed Chamberlain was like to Kieran Fallon. So Kieran, what are you doing with yourself now? Because he's obviously not as much yeah. in the public eye. But I'm based in Dubai over the winter. I do this, do that, blah, blah, blah. And then he, uh, um, AP thought Ed was going to say the same thing to him. And he goes, oh, I thought you were going to ask me about that. He goes, because I don't know what I'm doing. Mm, <laughs> Still a little bit. Yeah, he's a bit lost still, I'd say. Yeah, but he's, he's good on the high TV. Uh, he's brilliant. I think, he's, he's, yeah, he's, and he's uh, got a good, good relationship with Ed Chamberlain. They they bounce off each other quite well. Mick Fitz. Yeah. The coverage is um, very good. There's no, a I'll, picture of the lads there, and there's the oh, four there's ball. The lads yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Brian was saying it was a great day. Um, he was just in the studio actually, Brian earlier, so he popped in. But um, oh yeah, I must. I didn't. I AP McCoy. I'll be checking out. Because yeah, have a look at it. He's relentlessly interesting. Yeah. yeah. Right, we're going to move on to Kevin Doyle. It was one of our first episodes. The recently retired Kevin Doyle made the trip up from Wexford. Good chat. Here he is on the Euros experience in 2012. 
Um, right, wind on Euro 2012. You're a key component in it. It was the highlight of my career in terms of getting there. But what a disaster it was. And it certainly doesn't sit well with me. I don't particularly like talking about it. It was obviously won't go down in history as one of our no. greatest tournaments. Um, just sheer regret is what I feel in terms of the build up, the monotony of it. Um, obviously, the results. How does it sit with you a few years on? It's, you know, it's the first time an Irish team's qualified for Euros for so long, so yeah. it should have been, a, you know, it's looked on as more successful, but our performance is out there now, it's looked on as a nearly a joke, you know, people talk about it as, you know, and it's such a disappointment, um, and, you know, as my one major tournament, your major tournament, we missed out on the, the World Cup previous that, you know, um, right at the end in, in the France game. Um, so, you know, I look back on it, the monotony in the build up, I expected that. You know, I expected the weeks together and that that doesn't you know me, I'm happy to sleep in a hotel room during the afternoon and I can get over it. that that side of it was just my job and you're get ready for the Euros and this is what it is, this build up and this spell together. Um but you know, the the performance, you know, I didn't mind that if we put in the performance. That first game, the Italy game and the Spain game, they were in, they were two teams who were playing well at the yeah. time. And you think we're in we're under pressure Especially here Spain. anyway. Yeah. We're not this group is d- difficult, but we need to put in a performance against Croatia. And we were just I thought after all that build up and and disappointed with my own performance. I'm not talking about I'm not giving out about everyone else, but my own performance was pretty very average and not not what I wanted. And you know, just looking at the whole thing and as they say you know, just lots of little things weren't quite right, and they all built up to become big things, big issues. I remember, you know, I spoke about but the day before that game, and everyone's trying to rearrange where they're going. Just stupid things that shouldn't be. We shouldn't have ever been thinking about talking about or complaining about it. It shouldn't have been trying to rearrange what where our girlfriends were staying and wives were staying how was that an issue the day before the game because well, they are, they only arrived the day before the game, so right. we didn't the, the the hotel they were in. I remember was. Was it above a <laughs> was it above a lap dancing club or something like that? And uh, all of a sudden, its benefits yeah. obviously. <laughs> like you're grand. <laughs> we were getting phone calls the day before. Well, uh, you know, this Kevin or all of us. My, I, mine was leaving me alone. I think she was sorting out for herself. But lads were getting a bit of stick about that. But it isn't an issue. It can be dealt with. It's fine. But, but it's a need is distraction. That yeah, it's, you would imagine the Croatian yeah. players didn't have to deal with. Yeah, it becomes an issue when you're together and stuff is niggling at you when you're together for so long everything I've you said know, that before yeah. about what, what like we, we genuinely got on didn't we and it's probably, yeah. probably the case in all the Ireland squads you've been in as if, I presume but that group really really mm. got on well so it's not like you hear the England teams in the past the egos the, no. the north-south divide that was never the case with us but by the end of it I think we were doing each other's heads in Yeah, we really were it went on that long and Kev's mentioned the little things just so who's, escalated so whose fault was all of that? Well, it can't be the players' faults, and I've thought about this a lot since I've retired, since that tournament, because you were saying about the monotony, and we expected that, we expected the same training. They should have thought about that. The experts should have thought about that, the the management team, the the sports science department, all that medical, because they should have anticipated long, hard season. We had Steve McLaren on the show last week talking about England 2002 World Cup, first half amazing against Brazil then they just looked shattered they were gone because of the season they had um, so they should have known the type of training we did our training sessions were full on weren't they, yeah, they were. it wasn't like you know an Italian type training session where they can go through the motions mm. if players weren't putting it in our training session you'd be on them you know because we trained how we played and they would have to curtail maybe the times or should have curtailed yeah. the times or there should have been more downtime. Um, so were these misgivings, doubts expressed to, was there a leadership group within the squad that you could discuss it as a group and then speak to the management? I think, you know what, a big loss, I don't, Liam Brady wasn't there then and I felt yeah. he was he was really good go-between to be able to go and speak and he, obviously fluent Italian, was able to go, you know, Trapattoni took him took what he said from us and, and when he yeah, left, Jeff respected him, yeah, yeah, he respected him and would take it on board. I think when he left, we lost, we lost that bridge or that link to be able to you know, I felt I liked Marco Tardelli, but I don't think he would take on board no. what you were telling him. You know, he was. And so, when you've lost to Croatia and Italy, and you know that no matter what happens in the Spain game, you're out. Yeah. Are you guys already mentally on the on the on your holidays in the build-up to the Spanish game? Like you can't wait to get out of there. Oh, the Italian game. So Sorry, the Italian game. Spain yeah, you know you're out. out. We know we're out. Yeah. So, are you have have guys checked out mentally already? 
I think it was very tough. It was a tough couple of days. It was. It was. It was for me. It'd be. It'd, it'd have been on a downer. And this is really sad to say. Even before a ball was kicked, because of the atmosphere that had been the first January. game. Yeah, I remember I was rooming with Wardy, Stephen Ward, and this one's talking about in terms. Of, I I really like Wardy. Got on well, room together for a couple of years. We had to just go in separate rooms because we're just niggling. It was he snores the whole time. He does like, snore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, nozzle on him. Very interesting. Yeah. I was only chatting about it to my wife last night, actually. I you don't like talking about it. Stop going on she about brought, it, will you? She brought it up. Um, <laughs> and you were even grumpy then, like you were at the height of your career. Uh, that's very yeah. interesting, yeah. Sad, sad. Right, we're going to have to crack on. Speaking of, we mentioned him actually in that one, Steve McLaren. Um, he's just been appointed the QPR manager and we caught up with him back in February. He tells a story about the England players at half-time, which you just mentioned there, in 2002 World Cup quarter-final against Brazil. I've done three three tournaments with uh, Spain. We didn't know what to do with the players at the end of the season. They looked absolutely dead on their feet. If you kept them going, they'd die. Um, if you gave them a break at the end of the season, it was difficult to get them back to the levels again. Did you give them a little mini pre-season? Did you need to... It was so difficult. And we found that we were okay at the start of the tournament, but come the, uh, the, the last 16, the quarterfinals, we were dead on our feet. And I remember it well in, in, in Japan 2002 against Brazil. Fantastic first half. We came in at halftime. I swear, I've never seen the players were white, white, exhausted, gone. We were one nil up. And I thought, oh, we just need to hang on. Fatigue made us, made us go down to 10 men and in the end lost 2-1 and every tournament since the players have looked leggy tired and mentally I think the key thing is mentally because our top players are playing Champions League till the end mentally it's very difficult to get up for a major major tournament after a long slog of a season Can I give you the um, outside perspective of McLaren because I know you've done games on Sky with him I think McLaren, and I think really good coach at United when they won the treble, all the players seemed to really think he was good. And then as a manager became a bit naff, and stuff that jumps to mind is the Dutch accent, mm. a bit ridiculous. And I know he's doing it to try and make himself more understandable, but a bit ridiculous. Mm. And honestly, it's it's an unfair to th- thing to think of, but um, the umbrella when they're about to miss out on the Euros. And he literally only has the umbrella because it's raining and he's receding badly and he's that worried about his image that he knows that the mm. rain is going to destroy or expose his hairline and so he's got a bloody umbrella and I think that's not really what you should be worried about and even the talking to the PR people before every interview mm. um, and the, you know, the teeth and just a bit in awe of some of the players as well like the showbiz side of the players that's all the like the seven or eight quick things that we all spring to mind straight away remember with McLaren yeah, and I think it's a shame I really do because right. like I, I, I've spoke to you about like I've spent time with him during a game and you can tell what people are like when they're watching it, how much knowledge they have or lack of knowledge in some cases. Or some people you do games with, they're not even interested in the game. They don't even watch it. They're just on their phone yeah. or whatever. He's a purist. And I'm with you in terms of coaching. By all accounts, I've not worked with him. Coaching's supposed to be very, very good. Yeah. But he's running out of chances now. So he's got this QPR gig with financial restraints. They're just starting to even out at this stage from their financial troubles in the last few years. So... Last chance saloon, yeah, ish. I would say to for make him an impact, yeah, as he would put it, ish. <laughs> uh, we're going to move on to Burnley. Start of May, we were given unbelievable access to one of the best clubs in the Premier League, one of my favourite clubs. Yes, it is one of the best clubs. Sean Dyche and Burnley FC opened the doors to the Keith Andrews Show, and here's how we got on. And here's how we. <laughs> So we're here at Turf Moor, the home of Burnley Football Club. What's an amazing season they have been on. Seventh in the Premier League. European football looks very, very likely. Where they are right now, just a few points away. Sean Dyche, the, the journey 
that he's brought this football club on in the five and a half years really, really shouldn't be underestimated. Two promotions, a relegation, stayed up last year. The recruitment over the years has got better and better. This football club, who has rich history in terms of going back 50 years, the last time they played in Europe, but in the modern era, to be seventh in the Premier League, the chance to finish sixth, really is a fairy tale. Sean, firstly, thank you very sincerely much for letting us in behind the scenes. A super day from the moment I've walked in that gate. I've just been speaking to you about it. I can't believe the atmosphere around a club that is sitting 17th in the club, how welcoming, how hospitable it is. That must make you very proud. Yeah, well, first of all, it's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, the, the, the fact is that, you know, beyond a result, we believe that the players have a certain level of professional conduct, you know, and I think that's important. You know, some of the old school traits that we were brought up with, by the way, you know, you've got to be willing to work hard here, you, but you've got to have manners, you've got to have respect, you've got to have a bit of honesty about the way you conduct yourself. Only European football. Yeah, it's, and, and they deserve it, do you know what I mean? And, mm. I, I, you, you know, you think Leicester won the league, do you know what I mean? What, on, on the back of what? Mm. Great lads, great togetherness. I mean, everyone's looking for this magic. Formula. And it's work hard, mm. be fit, be together, play for the team. Mm. It takes you a long way in our game, mate. So that was Burnley. When you say to Dice you can't get over the atmosphere there. Yeah. What did I mean? Well, you've been at lots of football clubs. Yeah. You know what an atmosphere should be like and tends to be like, mm. and then you were struck by the atmosphere there. So what's the difference? Yeah, like, well, go back to, like, the, the highest I finished in the Premier League would have been ninth, Blackburn, West Brom, ninth, tenth. And at that type of environment, sometimes you have egos. And the higher you go up that chain, that food chain of Premier League teams, I think it's it's full of egos. Yeah, okay. So when you go into it, sometimes in, in, in dressing rooms, in changing rooms, there's little splits, there's little clicks. So I walk straight into the canteen. First of all, before I even get there, it's staff. Yeah, lovely to see you, blah, blah, we knew you'd come in. Just nice, friendly. I've been to I've been to a Premier League. I went into Liverpool a couple of years ago as part of my one of my coaching courses, and it was like trying to get through Fort Knox. Yeah. Look, I understand there's got to be a global security. company. Yeah, Liverpool's but different. That, that's what I'm talking about. And yeah. like, certain players would say hello, other than bouncing around, strolling, you know. Whereas you walk into Burnley, you just made feel at ease straight away. It was just so nice, so right. welcoming, and you could tell. Look, they, it was after that they started to go on a bit of a tricky run, but until that, I think they'd won five on the bounce, mm. and the atmosphere was just nice through the roof. Yeah. Lads having a bit of crack. It was like sometimes when you walk into lunch, I used to do it at certain clubs, didn't want to sit with him because I've just kicked the lumps out of him on the training pitch and we've got a bit of niggle. Yeah. Lunch there, we were sitting amongst the players, chatting away, myself and Joseph. Players were walking, then we look at where to sit, where's the new seat? Bang, sit down. It's just, okay. just nice. a nice atmosphere and it comes from Sean Dyche, obviously. Yeah, great, interesting. It comes from Sean Dyche. Okay, we got one more and we got two more pieces actually. This one was the Hunt Brothers. Joined the show back the in April Hunt for Brothers. a chat around the Masters, the Masters which we were supposed to be at, if you remember, but Stephen didn't produce. The news has just broken that Mick McCarthy was leaving Ipswich at the end of the season. Here is Stephen working on Mick. Well, he's a manager, you know, certainly better than me. Signed you twice, uh, Wolves and at uh, Ipswich. Mm -hmm. I find it very, very sad. As you know, I cover championship games every week. I think the Ipswich fans are away with the fairies. I really do. I, I find it sad the way it's become so toxic, or mm -hmm. it hasn't become, it's gone now. It's, mm -hmm. it's the end of a, of a chapter in their history. Five and a half years, drastically overachieved in his first few years in terms of the budget that's available for him, mm -hmm. what to do with that club. He should be just staying up in the division is probably an achievement mm -hmm. to get to, in and around playoffs yep. for his first few seasons. Okay, last season, not great. Had the opportunity going back six, eight weeks ago. You know that pivotal time of your mm -hmm. season. Can you push on to the playoffs? They haven't been able to do that. Mm -hmm. I find it really, really sad what's gone on there. Yeah, they spent three million in five and a half years. I think it was, was what it was. Maybe 71 free transfers, something like along them lines that he signed turnover of players. When you're on a small budget, it's very difficult. So I know the way... He works from Ipswich days. Wolves is a bit different. Yeah, budget-wise yeah, was budget wise, But he, he was successful. Mm. I think with the Ipswich fans, they, they'll only realise how good he is when he's gone. 
I said that on Sky a few weeks yeah. ago and I got barred. Yeah. Because of the, the, there was the Norwich uh, Ipswich derby yeah. and there was all that kind of f- for Mick on in a little bit of trouble. Do you remember in his times of a celebration? Yeah. yeah. He had a, was having a little pop. There's a the reason fans. why Mick is successful because deep down it probably was at the Ipswich fans, I reckon. But deep down, he'll tell me to bugger off too mm. in certain situations. When I went to see him on certain situations in terms of playing or whatever. Mm. But that was him. That's what made him successful. He was he's stubborn. He's good. He believes in himself. He's the boss. Mm. So that, so you you mentioned about Steve McLaren, things that spring to mind. What springs to mind when you, when you think of Mick McCarthy? Um, I guess Saipan does to, mm. to a point. Do you, but you know what ultimately springs to mind is how incredibly likeable he is. And for me, with Mick and Roy mm. over the last 16 years, in terms of who I think is the more reasonable person and a good guy, like it's Mick by, Mick's won the war for me. Yeah. You know, at the time I was all behind Roy. I was 16, 17, I was in school, I was a Man United fan. It was like Roy Keane is the only one with standards in this mm. setup. But I just think there is a decency about Mick. He's very real like in his press conference. Himself. And then that's but that that general sense was copper fastened. Um, last year, me and Kev went out to Carton House yeah, for pre season, yeah. sat down with him, and he's just a gent and genuine. Yeah, off off uh, mic and on mic, chatting about golf for about ten minutes. Mm. Just a really likable fella. Yeah. Like Jesus, I can see how as a player, if you're around that all the time, you'd want to go out and do well for him. Well, like more often than not, whatever team he's been at, country obviously as well with us. Yeah. He just gets the most out of players. He w- gets players buying into what he wants to go, yeah. where we're going to go as a team. And then, for instance, with Ipswich over the last couple of years, money-wise, hasn't been there. But fans obviously aren't content with no, mid-table mediocrity in their eyes. Yeah, it's crazy. But financially, and what he's had to deal with at that club, he deserves a decent job. And he's getting linked at the moment with some, some decent jobs. So I would imagine he would be back at a championship club and not to this in the future. No doubt, no doubt. Like, look at his career post Saipan, fantastic. Yeah. I would have him back as Ireland coach mm. in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Mm. Above what we have now and... Well, there was a lot of talk before, Mark. Yeah, and I would have had him. And when they go, if he's still doing a decent job in the championship and still looks like he's, you know, got that love for the game and the determination to keep coaching, I think we should go back to him. Chris Hout- Chris Hewton would be in the um, yeah, I, as well, wouldn't he? Well, he, I, I think Chris Hewton will stage. have bigger fish to fry for the next six, seven, eight years, Premier League level, and then we go to Hewton. But yeah. if you said to me our next two are going to be Mick, who has unfinished business, and, and I think Chris we'll do a good Hewitt. job, and then Chris, yeah. I would say lovely. Mm. Okay, that's all we have time for on the Keith Andrews Show. Thank you very much for watching over the last 16 weeks. I've had some very good co-hosts, Joseph. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I, don't to, I don't want to ask you who the best was, but, um, you know. I'll probably say Owen. We're back before <laughs> the start of next season. We're off the ball. We'll leave you with Johnny Walters and why he's continuing to play with Ireland. For now, take it easy. You're 35 in September. Yeah. Wes is gone. Daryl Murphy's gone. Martin says you can play till you're 64. I'm not sure about that. What, what, what are you thinking? No, look, as, uh, as long as I'm needed, uh, I'll play. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, uh, I met with Martin um, not too long. I, see, I think I was, I was seeing a specialist down in, in London. Uh, I went to meet him, called him up and, and, and spoke to him and I knew he was staying on, so I said, I think the plan was we were going to get to the World Cup, it was going to be great. Um, I probably would have retired at the end of it. Uh, it would have been the, the pinnacle, really, getting mm-hmm. to a World Cup, and the way it worked out. Um, talking about watching games, me and, me and Seamus were watching there, and we went to the Wales one. It was, oh, it was unbelievable. And then, but still, when you're watching, it's I've never been so nervous watching mm-hmm. a match. So then to go to the Denmark one 0 nil away, I thought brilliant, could bring them home, and it just didn't happen. And uh, you know, to, to have such a low like that when you're not playing. I couldn't have left it like that, mm. I don't think, and that was probably a big reason behind it. I couldn't have left it like that. Look, if it was, if there was players coming through now, that's not saying there's not players coming through. If there's players coming through, and I felt like I couldn't help. Then, um, do you feel like you have a bit of a responsibility? Then maybe because of one of the elder statesmen, you still think you can do a job, which well, I certainly do. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I think I think I can help, and I, I can, you know, I believe in myself. I think I can definitely do a job, and I'm still fit. You know, so I'll keep my fitness up, even though I haven't played this year a lot. 
or at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still in in, in good good nick, and uh, I know my fitness will always be up there. You know, if I'm not if I'm not running out there, I'm on a on a machine with my arms to keep my mm. lungs going up here. So um, hopefully now towards the end of the season I'll, I'll be involved and then going into the summer and then it's a big two years mm. and whether it be a case of helping um, I want to play as much as I can and that would be for club and for country but um, for country I think as I said I, I think I can do a job and help the boys that are coming through